discussion. All right, so as I was saying, if you are going to be taking STAT 216, um, you will talk about when you use the median as your measure of center, and um, you'll talk about then the five number summary. In this class, we specifically talk about using the mean as a measure of center, okay? So we're gonna use a measure of variation that goes along with that. My point on Friday was all three of these classes have the exact same class average, but there's different things going on in each class. So how can we essentially ask ourselves, how indicative is the mean? Like, okay, I did a test and I compute the class average. Does it give me a lot of information or does it not give me a lot of information, okay? And what I'm going to tell you is the more spread out your data is, the less indicative the mean is. Because remember how the mean gets affected by outliers, okay? We saw that, for example, there was that one student, um, student um, when I was in general talking about the mean, how all the scores were pretty solid, but then they got that 32 on that test and it brought their grade down to a B, whereas in general, they were an A student. So the problem with the mean is exactly what the benefit of the mean is, is it takes into account all of your data points, but one outlier can skew the whole thing, okay? So what we wanna ask ourselves is, is there a way to look at how spread out our data is in order to then be able to tell, hey, our mean is pretty indicative of what happened or it is not, okay? So we're gonna talk about measures of variation. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, motivate a formula, but we're just going to be using technology, okay? To, to do any of these computations. So the first measure of variation that people talk about and the most natural one that comes up is the range. Um, this is essentially the difference, in other words, subtraction, between the largest and smallest data values. And this is pretty meaningless as far as I'm concerned, um, because honestly, it's got a huge downfall it only really gives us information about extreme values, okay? So the downfall is, is it really only, and I'll show you in a second, us information about the extreme values. So for example, suppose I had the following data set. I have a three, and then how about um, a 71, a 77, another 77, an 80, an 81, an 84, and a 99, okay? Suppose this was a test that I gave, okay? I think you would grant me that the bulk of people scored high C's, low B's, wouldn't you? Okay, but if I was looking at the range here, it would be the largest data value minus the smallest data value. And it would look like I had a really, really big range. When in fact, I would count both of these people as just being total outliers, okay? So the range is a very easy one to compute in the sense of it's just taking the, finding the largest, finding the smallest and doing a subtraction problem, okay? But it doesn't really tell you about the meat of the data. So what our ultimate goal is, is we wanna find a measure of variation that includes all of the data values.
Additionally, let me say that gives us a way to determine how much the data differs from the mean. Okay, so we have a, a perhaps a fairly large set of data. We compute the average, okay? Our question is how indicative is this mean or this average to our data set, okay? The problem with the range is it only included the extreme values, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna find a measure of spread or variation where we can include each data point and somehow where we talk about the mean and ask ourselves how closely related is this to the mean, okay? Now, there's some natural intuition that happens, okay? And you're not responsible for deriving this formula, nor are you responsible for ever really having to use it. But one intuition that people tend to have is, well, why don't we then take each data point and find out how much it differs from the mean and then take the average of those differences. Does that seem plausible? Okay, so if we want to include each data point, some of our intuition would say, well, take each data point, see how much it differs from the mean, and take the average of those differences. Does that make sense? Yes, no. Okay. Well, so if I write my data values as x1, x2, x3, all the way to xn, these are our data values. We're going to use for right now x bar as the mean because that's what our calculator used. Essentially, what I'm suggesting is as follows. Take your first data value and subtract the mean. Take the second data value, subtract the mean and then do that on down the line and take the average of that, okay? So if we wanna see how indicative our mean is, we're taking the average of the distance between each of our data points in the mean, okay? So this is the first place where people's intuition goes. Well, I claim there's problems. Imagine that. Let's see what happens. I'm just going to take that class two that I listed. Okay, we saw that the mean was 50. And recall, we had the following data values. We had 40, 30, 60, 70, and 50. This was from the data that I gave you on Friday or the class notes. Well, Let's see what happens. This is a pretty chill data set. We can do this one by ourselves without any technology. So what I'm suggesting is take each data point and subtract the mean. We can do that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the differences and take the average of those. Well, what's 40 minus 50? Negative 10. What's 30 minus 50? Negative 20, what is 60 minus 50? 10, then 20 and zero, okay? What we're gonna do now is take the average of all of these values. What happens when I add all of these up? I get zero. And zero divided by, well, there's five data values is zero. Okay, what happened here? 
Well, first off, it makes sense we got zero, okay? Because that's what it means to have been the mean. Okay, the issue is we're looking at the division between or the difference between each data point and the mean, but the issue is some of our data points are smaller than the mean, some of our data points are bigger than the mean. So when we do the subtraction, don't the negatives and the positives offset each other? So the issue is, is these darn negatives, okay? We can think of that in a lot of examples, like if we see a negative in our bank account, for example, we could say these darn negatives, okay? We gotta get rid of these negatives because the issue is that there is this difference but some are smaller, some are larger. Well, there's a lot of different ways to get rid of negatives in math, okay? Other than just erasing them, okay? One of them is taking the absolute value, okay? You may or may not remember absolute values from an algebra class. Um, that's essentially just looking at the distance. But what we need to do is we need to come up with some way to get rid of the negatives so that whatever we do to it, we're obviously affecting our data. We need to be able to undo, okay? So in our situation, the best way we have to get rid of the negatives is we're gonna square each value. You wanna know why? because the square root will undo it. Now, this is not stuff that you're gonna have to come up with, but what I wanna show you is where this whole formula comes from. Notice we had this and the problem was that some of these were negative and some of these were positive and so they offset each other. So what I'm proposing here is square each of these differences. Take the average of those squares and then take the square root at the end to undo that. Now, what does that look like? Well, you take the first data point minus the mean and you square it. Second data point minus the mean and square it and go the way all the way on down the line and then take the square root of all of that. Because we know that the square root undoes squaring things. Okay? This looks pretty funky, huh? It's a, it's a decent sized formula. Now we can go back to that data set we ha had here and look at what happens. Right, I can do all these computations. I can square these numbers. What do I get when I square negative 10? 100. What do I get when I square negative 20? 400. What do I get when I square 10? 100. What do I get when I square 20? 400. And when I square zero? So essentially we're getting the square root of a thousand divided by five, oopsie, sorry, which is the square root of 200, which is about 14.14. So if we did that, this is what we would get for how spread out our data is. What does that mean? Okay, what that means is as follows. On average, the data points differed from the mean by about 14.14 points. Okay, this is measuring the average distance of each data point to the mean. This has a name and you all might've heard of it, this term before or standard, Sorry, I'm looking at one word and writing another word. 
This is called our standard deviation. Has anyone heard that term before? One person? Okay, standard deviations are things that, for example, those of you who are going into psychology or sociology, when you read studies, you're going to see the term standard deviation. It's always out there whenever the mean or the average is discussed, okay? It is an essential piece of data. And what I want to tell you is that we just pretty much intuited the formula for the standard deviation, okay? So when we're talking about the standard deviation, there's a few comments that I wanna make. Um, there's actually two sorts of standard deviations that one can look at. There's what we call the population standard deviation, and then there's what we call the sample standard deviation, okay? I'll talk about that in a second, but what I want to tell you is when you're talking about the standard deviation, what you're doing is you're getting a gauge on how spread out the data set is. Okay. And I'll get more into this in a moment, but um, it is essentially the average distance of the data points to the mean. To me, it's a lot more important that you understand what we are computing rather than being able to just plug things into a formula and compute it, okay? Now, a couple fine points that I wanna make are as follows. There's something called the population standard deviation. And in your calculator, that's written as sigma x. I'll show it to you. The use of our calculator is not gonna change from anything that we did in lesson nine. We're just gonna look at a couple more values that the calculator spits out at us, okay? And the formula for the population standard deviation is exactly what we had. You take each data point, subtract the mean, square it, add them up, divide by the number of data points, and that's your population standard deviation, okay? You use this standard deviation when you have the entire population, okay? Very rarely when you collect data and look at statistics, do you have the entire population. That's the whole point of, for example, when they do the census every 10 years, the idea is with the census that you're getting the entire population. More often than not, what happens in practice is one doesn't have the entire population. I mean, like if we were gonna query people, which candidate you prefer for you know, one of these house races, for example, going on in Montana, okay? Can you actually query the entire populate, voting population in Montana? Practically speaking, absolutely not, okay? So what we tend to do as statisticians is we tend to try to take a really good sample of the population. You know, that's the hardest thing is how do you know if your sample is good, okay? Can't just do, for example, asking at like a mall because, you know, in general, the entire population of Montana doesn't necessarily shop at malls, right? So, you know, how do you get a good sample? But the point is, is once you can collect a sample, um, what you're trying to do is generalize to the entire population, okay? That's something that you're gonna get at in a statistics class if anyone's going on and taking statistics. How do you collect a good sample? That's the hardest thing that people can do um, in terms of collecting meaningful data. 
But once you collect that sample, you wanna, the goal is to generalize then to the entire population. So what we are going to be looking at and what your online homework is going to be asking you for in, is the sample standard deviation and that's S, okay? So when your online homework asks you to compute the standard deviation, they're gonna want you to give the SX value, not the sigma X value. And you can ask, well, what is the difference? Well, the difference is as follows here. Let me write this down because I'm having trouble writing and talking at the same time. The difference is, is instead of dividing by N, we divide by N minus one, okay? That gives us wiggle room for an error. That's the only difference because essentially when you compute your sample standard deviation, your sample data is gonna be a lot closer to the mean than if you generalize it to the entire population. So the way we take into account that error that we get is instead of dividing by N is we divide by N minus one. You are not responsible for using either one of these formulas, but I want you to see that there's a difference. This is something you'll get more into in a statistics class. Honestly, what you're gonna need to do is to be able to push the buttons in the calculator box and read off your SX and your Sigma X, okay? So um, this is all fine and handy. We can actually do this. In fact, I'll take one example and push it in, in the calculator and show you what it, um, where you're going to read it. But what I want really you to take away is what does this mean, okay? And um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm gonna show you one example, then I'm gonna talk about what this means in the context of an example and what you're gonna be responsible for, like what my test questions would be. And, um, and then that'll close class for the day, okay? So for example, we can have quiz scores and we can have frequency, just to give you a little more practice with pushing buttons. Suppose we have these quiz scores, nine, seven, four, eight, and 10. And this is the frequency. Okay, so essentially what we're saying is seven people got a nine out of 10, five people got a seven out of 10, not that seven people got a nine out of 10, excuse me, five people got a seven out of 10, nine people got a four out of 10, 30 people got an eight out of 10, and two people got a perfect score. Oh, yeah. So what if I asked you to find the mean, the median, the mode, and our standard deviation? Well, we're going to push buttons in our calculator to do this, but we can read off our mode. What's our mode here? Eight, totally. Why? Because eight was the most frequently occurring data point. Okay, so um, again, I showed you how to use these calculators. Last time, I'm just randomly picking up this calculator. I'm not going to go through how to push these buttons again. But the first thing I'm gonna do is clear my lists. And now I'm gonna enter my lists, okay? Again, if you need a recap, watch last week's video, please, okay? So now I'm gonna enter my quiz scores. Today I remembered my reading glasses so I can actually see what I'm doing. So nine, seven, four, eight, and 10. Notice I picked a very small, data set. And now I put my frequencies in the L2. So I do 7, 5, 9, 30, and then 2. 
I press quit. I go down to one var stats. Notice my data is in L1. My frequency data is in L2. And here we have it. Apparently there were 53 people who took this quiz. My mean here, I'll go two decimal places, is 7.43. Notice here is my SX and here is my Sigma X, okay? Your online homework is going to want the SX, not the Sigma X. So here we would put 1.68. And then I have to scroll down a little further to get my median, and that is also eight. So it's really nothing different mechanically on your online homework. And what we're saying here, what does the standard deviation mean? It means that on average, our data values are 1.68 points away from the mean, which is 7.43. So I want to show you that computation-wise, it's no different than what we were doing last week. But now let me talk about what matters. Cool? In some situations, a standard deviation of 20 might be absolutely enormous. In some situations, a standard deviation of 20 might be minuscule. So when we talk about large and small standard deviations, that's very relative and it's very, very situation specific, okay? So it's really hard to talk about whether this is a large standard deviation or a small standard deviation unless you're given some sort of context, okay? Most often, it's easiest to make comparisons when you're given a couple different standard deviations, because then you can at least look and compare one's larger and one's smaller. But what I want to tell you is as follows. A smaller standard deviation, and I'm writing this down because I think that this is really the key of what I want you to take away, means that the average distance of the data points to the mean is small. Hence, our data values, the average distance is small, our data values must be closer together. Another way you could talk about that is less variable, more uniform, less spread out, all of these different ways of looking at this, okay? In sum, what that tells us is that the mean is a good indicator of the data set. Contrast that with a larger standard deviation. Well, that means that the average distance is higher, which then implies that the data is more spread out. It's less consistent. 
So if you're gonna use the mean, use caution. And I think that the moral of the story is this, large and small standard deviations are relative to the context and they're most meaningful when you can compare. So what I'm gonna do is close with just one example. We're not gonna to have to do any computations. I just wanna go through one example, okay? And this example is at least to me, what I want your general takeaway to be. So suppose we have two companies. And these companies both make batteries, okay? They're really exciting companies, okay? And so what they did is they we asked them, we wanted to look at how long the battery life is and how consistent the battery life is. So suppose from each company, we tested 10 batteries, okay? And from company one, we found that the average life of a battery was 26.2 hours and that the standard deviation is 3.1 hours. Suppose we took company two and we also tested 10 of their batteries and found that their average life was 29.1 hours with a standard deviation of 6.8 hours. So the two questions that we're gonna answer are as follows. Which company produced batteries? with a longer life expectancy. Because if we're really concerned about average life expectancy of batteries. Which company produced batteries with a longer life expectancy? Okay, we have a vote for two. And I'm gonna tell you, you're exactly right. The average life is another way of saying the mean. Okay, company two, because it has a higher mean. Okay, but now what if I ask you which company produced batteries more uniformly? with respect to their life expectancy. Company one, why? You have a smaller standard deviation. So while companies to batteries live longer on average, there was a lot of variation in how long they lived, okay? These are more consistent and more reliable. They don't live as long maybe, but what I would think if I looked at this data is yeah, companies too lived longer, but there was probably an outlier, right? 
that just lived extra super duper long that skewed our data. So what I would say is that yes, on average companies too lived longer, but company ones were a lot more reliable. We will talk more about this. What I wanna do real quick though, is share my screen um, to the class Moodle page. I'm not done with this section. We have more to do in here. Um, but for all of you on, um, on Zoom, if you go to class activities, here is class activity six. It is due on Friday. For those of you who are here, I have physical copies. We'll continue this conversation tomorrow.